And it kind of puts you in a stance when you start reading about that, that God can seem to be selfish, but at the same time, a God who is God deserves to be praised, and he exists to praise himself. And so when we look at the beauty of holiness, because we see God has eternally been perfect, the beauty of holiness in Christ is no different because in the New Testament, he says, I and my Father are what? One. We're the same. And he gives, the, he gives that. So the Psalm 29, 2 says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor or the beauty of holiness. This God in 2 Samuel 22, 31, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all of those who take refuge in him. He's perfect. But in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, uh, Christ says this, You therefore must be perfect to the disciples, as your heavenly Father is perfect. He said, Be ye holy, for I am holy. So we, we can take a few moments as we build up to this sacrifice of Christ, and we can just thank God for the perfection and the perfected state that he enjoys right now. Isaiah said it this way. He said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And the angels were all about him, crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Read Revelation, and you see in the, in the times when we will be worshiping and experiencing the end times and, and glorifying God forever, that people are falling down and worshiping our perfect God. Isn't that great? We don't have to mess with sin anymore one day. We're going to be perfected because of what Christ has done. And Christ is the perfect sacrifice of God's re reconciliation. And the verse will be up here in a moment. But Hebrews 4.15 says this. We don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are. Now get this. But Christ did it without sin. Isn't that amazing? Christ did this life without sin. 100% God, 100% man, and he did this life without sin. That gives me hope. And so it gives us an introduction into our passage today that may help us. We are reconciled through Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. If you will, just let me read the verses. Unfortunately, due to time, I'm not going to be able to go verse by verse here, but I would like for us to think about the experience that Christ went through. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation through Christ. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. Through Christ, in Christ. Not counting their trespasses against him as entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Through Christ, in Christ, I no longer face the wrath of God, unbelievable. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. It's through Christ, in Christ, now I'm for Christ. God making the appeal through us. So God now makes the appeal to men and women who need to be reconciled to him through us. The gospel lived out in my life daily. So we implore you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. And that word there, that, that little phrase, be reconciled to God, it could also mean this in, in the inductive sense, be reconciled by God. So not only do I enjoy the reconciliation of God in my salvation, but I enjoy a reconciliation to God through Christ, by God, daily. And I have this connection now to the Father who is perfect. And here's where I just want to sit for a few moments. For our sake, unbelievable, he made him, God made Christ, you ready for this? To be sin. To be sin who knew no sin. That's the experience that Jesus had never gone through. But he did. Because it was God's plan. Our sake, he was made to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him, Christ, we might become, you ready? The righteousness of God. 
So I see through Christ, in Christ, now I'm for Christ, and it's because of, on behalf of Christ, his sacrifice has been making me and has made me the righteousness of God. Does that not give you hope as a believer? Does that not fill your heart this morning of what he's doing? Now here's the thing. What we don't like to remember a lot of times is the process. The process. Because Christ had experienced it once in eternity of eternities was brutal. And so we need to look a little bit at this in the perfection of God. Remember Isaiah 53? Surely Christ has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for whose transgressions? Ours. He was crushed for whose iniquities? Ours. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. And it says here, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. But here's what the perfect Lord's sovereign will was. And the Lord has laid on Christ the iniquity of us all. From eternity to eternity, Christ in his perfection had never experienced sin. And in one moment of human history, the whole sin of the world was laid on someone who had never experienced it before. An awesome thought. I digress just a moment for a picture that many of us have seen before in 1991, Beauty and the Beast It was interesting, the other day we had a basketball game here about three weeks ago, and in, in the Cove, we went to get a drink or something like that in the Cove, I noticed that there was Lion King 2 on and ESPN. For some reason, Lion King King brought the attention of people I never thought would love movies, or that kind of movie. But you guys know it, don't you? This is like, this is the stuff we grew up on. If this came out in 1991, you were probably, what, like eight, eight or nine years old, maybe four or five when you were exposed to this, and you're like, I know that story. Okay? I can't tell, so I, I don't know. My math is off. But can I just make a statement that has been hitting my mind and thinking about this? See, in the story, you know that Belle, I believe that's her name, Belle, <laughs> right? Yes, okay, see, you're tracking with me. That I had to make sure of that. She had to fall in love with the beast to make sure that the, and she didn't even know that the beast would change into something at the end of the movie when she kissed it. And she said, what do you, she kissed the beast. It's kind of like the story of Christy and Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> she changed it. But we just read two passages as you track with me on this thought because we're going to go much deeper here and much more serious. But get this understanding. Christ did not kiss the beast. He became the beast. See, beauty, Christ, became the beast, me, my sin, so that I could become beautiful, the righteousness of God. Beauty, Christ, became the beast so that I could become beautiful, the righteousness of God. Isn't that good? And see, here's the process that took place. You think about now the mind of Christ in the last hours of his life. We see these pictures and understand them. He was in the garden, and what did he say to his father? If there's any way that I don't have to go through this experience, take it from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. And we see the consummation in the beginning of the most brutal sacrifice of innocent humanity that we can think of. And he was taken through the streets. He was mocked. He was given up. And the finality we see in the narrative of the cross, the gospel in reality, of Jesus hanging on the cross for each one of us. 
And every one of our sins, from every person who has ever been born to every person who will ever be born, was laid on the person who had never experienced it ever, ever, ever before. Every sin and ego that is blame, jealousy, conceit, retaliation, every abusive word to a child from a dad, every slap on the face from one angry spouse to another, every hateful word that a teenager girl would say to her mother, every time a person retaliates in anger, every sin from infidelity of a wife and husband, perversion of homosexual acts, pedophilia, sex trafficking, kidnapping, drug deals, abuse of prescription drugs, replacement of satisfaction in anything but God. Every bit of gossip from TMZ to the deacon and his family at the church. Every lack of thankfulness for, uh, of unthankfulness for the provision of God from a job to an education to a meal that I don't like. Every fight between brothers. Every bit of bitterness from parents that cut their kids out of the will and the children that hate them for it. Every slam of the door when things don't go my way. Every, every life affected by chemical warfare, torture during war, sinister minds of taking the spirit out of people based on pure hate, even racist statements. Every disrespect of the law, the government, parents, teachers, bosses, co-workers, peers, exes, pastors, elders, deacons. Every harsh word a dad says to their child when they don't perform in athletics, academics, or the arts. Every time a person gets drunk, commits adultery, abuse pornography. Every performance that steals the sanctity of marriage, perverts sexuality, and mocks the character of God by stating after that perversion, I'd like to thank my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for the talent I have. Every murder by every person, whether it be the Zodiac Killer, Ted Bundy, Saddam Hussein, or Adolf Hitler. Every selfish, sinful act that led to the gift of pregnancy that was in turn snuffed out through the murder of a child. Every creation of man-made religion so that the truth of God is ignored for personal benefit. Every small sin that was addressed in the last chapter. Jesus hated all. <clears throat> is it any wonder that while he was hanging on the cross, that he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because at that moment, he was experiencing for us what he had never experienced from eternity to eternity. Jesus was the sacrifice for mankind, for my sin. He was made sin, who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. What an awesome thought. How does this hit me today? I hope in your mind and in your heart, when we think about the gospel and the cross of Christ, we automatically switch over to the resurrection because our faith is dead without the resurrection. But do a little bit of a, a just a, a um, overview of the benefits that we have received from Christ from these verses. Verse 14 and 15, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. We were made beautiful. We no longer live for ourselves. Verse 15 says this, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. How am I made beautiful? My life is not about me any longer. It's about Christ. It's about the gospel. We no longer uh, live for ourselves, but we are a new creation. The familiar verse, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. See, Christ has made us beautiful today. We have the ministry of reconciliation from God. All this is from God in verse 18, who through Christ 
reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So our lives now are the picture and the mirror of the sacrifice of Christ and the righteousness of God that brings us back and people see and say, I want the reconciliation of God in my life. We are ambassadors for Christ. Therefore, we are ambassadors, in verse 20, for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. Be reconciled by God. We're the ambassadors. We are the beautiful. And in verse 21, we are the righteousness of God. What a title. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I'm a new creature. The old has passed away. I'm an ambassador for Christ. I have been made beautiful because of the sacrifice of Christ. And at moments in my life when I start meditating on scripture and seeing what Christ has done for me, I call out to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I call out to you today. Can we take a moment to thank Christ and thank God for his sacrifice for us? He did not have to experience it, but he did because God loved us. So therefore, in the beauty of the new creation, be an ambassador that is the picture of the righteousness of God. Be an ambassador that shows to other people around that life is worth living. Life now is given to me because of the righteousness of God and the sacrifice of Christ. He experienced my sin so that I can cry out to God, Abba, Father. May we be overwhelmed with the reality of what Christ did and the experience he went through for us. May God help us to be thankful. Praise God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Lord, I know it's a little beautiful, but the word hits us so tight. It's like a two-edged sword that cuts us. And I think of selfish how, how just incredibly self-centered I am. And I think of the sacrifice of Christ and how the sins of the world were laid on earth. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters here today. I pray for the church. I pray that you would be with them. I pray that you would help us, Lord, to be the mirrors and the light and the salt that you've called us to be. But I also pray for that individual in here this morning who is questioning whether or not God loves them. And they would look back and say, God does love me. He gave his son so that if I believe on him, I'd have everlasting life. So there may be somebody in here that needs you, God. I pray that your word would work in their life and that the spirit would work right now. And God, we'll be so, we'll be so careful to give you the praise because you are the only one that is praising you. Thank you for the gift of